So, um, so 2008, 2009, I, yeah. I recognize what is happening now is way different than what was happening then because then you didn't see as much price drop off as it was just activity drop off. But the uncertainty feels the same. I don't feel think it feels the same at all. The demand is going nowhere. The affordability is gone. There's all these people that still want to buy more properties. They just can't do it because they can't afford the money that's being lended. Welcome to the Tom Story Show with Steve Karish and Tom Story, where we discuss everything real estate or whatever else is on our minds. All right. Well, oh, yeah. that was caught on rec re recording, so that's good. <laughs> so we'll start like that. That'll be our, our opener. It'll um, add to your dark voice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, my very dark and flummy. All right, let's do this thing. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Tom Story Show. I want to thank everybody that's watching us uh, on YouTube. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Uh, we are almost at our goal of getting to 1,000 people by the end of this year. And even though both me and Steve have larger followings on our main channels, we're really proud of that because we started this from scratch like three months ago. And you guys coming back each week. Um, is really exciting for us and we're going to keep trying to deliver for you. If you listen on the audio platforms and you haven't already, but you are getting an ounce of value from anything that we talk about on this podcast, all I ask is maybe check out Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star review because that will really help our rankings as we continue to grow this small little podcast into something very, very big. I'm very excited to announce our guest this week, who is Jen D, someone that I know personally in the Toronto real estate market. She has been a realtor for over 16 years. So this isn't the first time that she's seen a market kind of slow down and change. She's been through this before where I'd say a good percent of, of our industry has not. Um, she is an author, and I said this to Kathleen Black when I had her on as well, like I'm jealous. I wish I could do it. I'm so bad with grammar. I, I need someone else to help me. I want to write a book one day. And you are now turning your business into actually helping other real estate agents with your uh, real estate business acceleration program. So Jen D, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's really great to be here. And I'm excited to be here. When I was listening to your podcast a couple of weeks ago, I thought there was a lot that um, that I agreed with, especially what Steve was saying about he wished that there had been some some better training for new agents getting into real estate. And I was like, well, this is exactly what I think. And this is why I actually created my acceleration program. Well, we're, at, we're off to a good start because mostly people don't agree with Steve. So <laughs> that's a good way to start things. Um, we let's let I want to get to that. Actually, let's start with that because yeah. I think that's really interesting. So on a previous episode, uh, we, we were interviewing Taylor Hack, and he said something that I'd never thought about. And he said, you know, we're, we're all told like the, you know, 20% of realtors make it past their first two years, right? That's the stat we hear. But he said only 13% make it to five years. And that yeah. the general consumer, the person that we are helping, if that is a true number, is working with a tourist, someone that's not going to be around for a while because they don't even make it to that five-year point. And Steve, we had discussed that potential program where when Steve started, he joined another successful agent that had that mentorship. I had to find it through through coaching and then, and then just kind of modeling systems from that. But let's start there. So Jen, for the agents right now that are struggling, scared, thinking, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this anymore. And even because I know there's a lot of people that listen to this that are going through the real estate license, trying to learn as they get into it, that probably signed up when the market was booming and now it is not booming. And they're thinking, well, uh, is this actually a good idea? I guess like what's the mindset and, and what's the kind of programs that, that you're currently doing that you're launching for, for people that are in this position? So I think when I started, I guess I came from a very process oriented background. And so when I got into real estate, I knew I started similar to you. I started with coaching right away because I thought, well, I may as well get help right out of the gate. And especially after one week in real estate, when I realized everything that they taught me in school was not what's on the other side. And when you walk into the office and you're like, how do I even book an appointment? Like you're not even given some of the base, base, baselines of what to do. Um, I don't know. I just always, I built it up from there. And then in the, in my later years as an agent now, I've realized that people started, started asking me questions about 
CRMs and how I've hired admin assistants and how I've done it virtually. And I realized that we, we've never been taught that. Like no one says to you, hey, you're running a business. It's always just called, you're going to be a real estate agent, but not, this is a business. You're going to be managing accounting. You're going to be managing being a manager, employers, web develop development, marketing. Like it's just, there's a side that it just looks like it's glamorous when that's not really the case. And I think it would be beneficial to both the consumers and to agents and to our industry if we had proper training on this as a company, like the CEO doesn't just walk into a to a bank and say, hey, I've got no experience, but I'm going to run this, you know, huge tier bank. Let's just roll with it. I remember someone saying to me at a conference many years ago, or maybe they said it on stage uh, and, and it stuck with me always. And it was like, he's like, I've been to quite a few real estate agents funerals, <laughs> but never a retirement party. <laughs> And I was like, oh, <laughs> because uh, we just, you know, we, I don't really care how many properties you sell. I think it's, it's all about like actually running the right systems and having processes. And, and then, and I think me and Steve are, are true believers in this as well. And, and that's why we're so excited to talk to you. So I guess what would your advice be for that agent right now that needs that structure that's getting started, that's coming into a market that frankly, it's going to be difficult. Yeah. Well, and, and I hosted a webinar last week on that because I think a lot of people are going to be intimidated and this is where they're going to fall down because they're going to be, what should I do? Because the market isn't crazy. They're not going to be having lots of showings and they are going to probably run into like, well, I got into the wrong industry. I need to get out. There's going to be a lot of knee jerk reactions that don't necessarily need to happen. And so one of the things that I cover off in the course is having having daily tasks or having ways to build the business fundamentals. So there's a lot of coaches out there that are going to help you get leads and, and run with your business to grow it from that perspective. But if you don't have the base to have the CRM, to mm -hmm. make sure your accounting is ready, all of those things, it doesn't matter where you go, you're going to crumble, right? So use this time now to start building the business fundamentals that nobody talks about, that nobody thinks about. And they're not glamorous, but it's going to save you so much time and allow you to grow later on the other side of this recession. So go ahead. Yeah. So I was just, you know, I was, as you were saying that, I was thinking, so, uh, it's like personality types as well, right? Like some people are so good at being organized and I'm fairly organized. Like my desk is clean. I, I like my, my computer desktop doesn't have things everywhere. Like that would stress me out. Right. And I know Steve is the most like list oriented person ever. Like he loves it. Um, for agents that naturally don't have that ability. Are you outsourcing that? Do you have to be the one that does it? Um, I'm curious to know your thoughts on that. You do not need to be. Look, I encourage people to play to their strength. And when you know your strength, then hire other people to help you. And by hiring other people, it doesn't need to be expensive. But at least by acknowledging, here are the areas that I need help in, or this is how I build my business. I'm good in this one area, so I should outsource the other areas or make sure that they're still taken care of. And again, one of the things I talk about in my book and in this course is I've basically taken my 16 or 17 years, taken all of my failures, all of the things that cost me a lot of money and said, here are the best ways to do it in a cost effective manner. Because when you get into real estate, everyone wants your money, right? You can go out and spend 10, 20, 30, $40,000 and you really have nothing to show for it. So how do you, especially going into a recession, make sure that you're building your business from a cost effective way, recognizing, look, these are not things that are complicated to do. You just have to acknowledge that they're there and then take the step towards them. And again, acknowledging because um, the E-Myth revisited that mm. book, right? He's why, why most businesses fail in the first five years. It's because you start out with a passion of your own. You build that. And then as your company grows, you hire people, they start doing things, they start doing it their way and then their way. And then suddenly you've got no control over the company and you've lost probably a lot of revenue, right? So if you are somebody 
and you're like, I'm great at marketing, but I'm really bad at accounting or business planning, then get help with them. But at least acknowledge that those are there. And again, it doesn't need to be expensive. There's a lot of things that I do that are in my business that are not costly. Yeah, I even think hearing you say that, like this podcast is a good example of that. It's like, I'm good at showing up places and talking and Steve's good at organizing it and, and making sure everything's ready to go and when it's going to schedule and get it out. And like, I don't think, well, maybe Steve could have done this on his own. I pro I couldn't have done this on my own. Like I, I, I needed the back end structure to make this even possible. Yeah. And you know, for me, when I look at you, I think, geez, that's really organized that you are, you commit to this once a week, you get this done and you, you know, there's probably a lot of production behind the scenes and then you release it on Sundays. That is organized to what you're good at, right. which is great. So it's good, it's best to play to that. But I think a lot of agents too, when they start, and we've all been told this, they get into it for money, freedom, be your own boss. But Which one do you want? It's one of those three. <laughs> Right. Or it's, you still, none because you're running, yeah. you're running a company, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you want to be successful, if you want to fly by the seat of your pants and you want to not know, you know, what you owe the government and you want to be stressed and take half if vacations, you, if by you all If you want to know what not the opposite of freedom is, become a real estate agent. This episode of the Tom Story Show is brought to you by the best Canadian in-person real estate training seminar that there is. Masters Academy, presented by Richard Robbins International, November 14th and 15th in Northern Toronto. Listeners and viewers of the Tom Story Show podcast can receive $200 off of their ticket to this exclusive event by using the link in the description right now down below this video. These unique session formats include things like small giants, lightning rounds, and even genius interviews with top producing real estate agents from across the country. So if you are a real estate agent anywhere in the country, you need to be at Masters Academy November 14th and 15th in Toronto. I myself will be there. I'm flying in specifically for this event. Both Tom and I will be there in person and so should you. So register today for Masters Academy 2022 happening November 14th and 15th. That's a two day event, both days from nine until 5 p.m. at the Universal Event Space in Northern Toronto. Sign up right now using the link down below in the description, save and now back to the podcast. If By you wanna means. know what not the opposite of freedom is, become a real estate agent. Because yeah. you are now tethered to your clients twenty four seven, so you're like, oh, I don't, I don't like this. I'm going to, uh, you know, leave this job that I have that's eight hours a day because my boss asked me to work weekends, and then I'm going to change it for fifty bo fifty different bosses this year, and they're all going to call me at. I, I mean, I had a text message the other day at five fifteen in the morning. It didn't get replied to at that time, but that's when people are, you know, connecting back with you, and everybody just think, oh, there's the freedom in this. The, the freedom is not there to escape your responsibilities, right? And I think I've learned a lot about that because when I started, um, one of my coaches said, you, you are in control of your schedule a little bit, right? Like you can choose to be available on Sunday night at nine, or you can set some boundaries in terms of when you want to respond and when you don't. Um, and I found that sometimes by doing that, it didn't necessarily feel good because mm -hmm. sometimes you have to do things. And now I've sort of adapted a different model of freedom whereby like for the past two years, I've spent a month in Europe mm -hmm. and I've worked from there. I've taken, you know, two weeks vacation and then I've worked the, the rest because I have systems and processes. So because I have the systems and processes, I've developed a different kind of freedom that probably isn't as alienating to some people, right? Because some people may not like, oh, you only work nine to five or only you, you only work six to eight or like I once had a designer tell me that and I was kind of put off by that. I was like, oh, well, what happens if my question comes in afterwards? Like, so having systems and processes, I think has allowed me to better care for my clients as well and provide a different level of freedom, a freedom, a level of freedom that's probably more sustainable in the long run. When, when you go on vacation, so your current setup now, 
are you do you have other agents that are helping you when you're gone do you have team members that way or is it mostly just the administrators taking care of things because you know at some point at the growth uh, of you want to build things out or you want to leverage yourself more in any business someone's got to do it right i mean like it doesn't just disappear so yeah. I, I guess like how do you i was on like a mini vacation last week from a it was a tuesday to sunday i went to jamaica and it was good my team crushed it when i was gone i came back they're like we don't need you anymore but uh but it was it was like there was still people in place to take care of things so your current structure i'd be interested to know i guess what is your current structure and how are you able to take four weeks in the summer uh, consistently and still run a profitable business where your clients aren't feeling like, where are you? Right. Yes. So the first time I went away for a month was actually a really good learning because I had three listing presentations while I was away and I managed to secure two of them. Um, and I even managed to get it set up because I guess my stager, my photographer, they've all worked with me so they know what to do. And I was honest about the situation to to my to the clients. I said, I'm here. What you know, the expertise that I bring is going to show up in terms of my prep, the negotiations, the paperwork, how the listing is presented. I'll be back in time before it goes live. Um, now my ops manager, she runs everything. And because again, it's systemized, she can start with a lot of the stuff that needs to happen. People are open to having meetings on zoom now, which has been a, yeah. a really good thing. Obviously we still need to see the property, um, with buyers. Yeah. I have another agent that helps me out if I need to do that. I have also prepped well in advance. So when I was took first took that month, I started prepping in June or even May. And I found that letting my clients know I was, it took a bit of pressure off. Did do you find every time you book the vacation as well, that your business becomes as busy as it possibly can be <laughs> the day before you leave? Because that's just the way sales works is like, I want to go relax. Like, no, everyone wants me now. <laughs> I do my best work on the way to the airport at yeah. 4 a.m. and in the lounge at 6 and getting on that plane till they're like, shut your laptop down. So, yeah, um, that definitely happens a lot. And, yeah, look, I was just away for five days and I had meetings all day Monday, Tuesday, right? I, I took Saturday and Sunday off. There's always the pressure that we have listings, so we have to monitor it. Mm -hmm. But, you know... I still was able to do it from another location, which is nice because I have that backup. So I think your question was, how do I do it? What does my staffing look like? I've yeah. got the ops manager because I have probably like an 87 point process for sellers, something similar for buyers. Wow. And they're converted through. So from um, prospect to pre to during to live to afterwards. So those steps are there. And before we go, before I go away, her and I will have a meeting and we'll say what's on tap for the next five days that needs to be managed. And of those 87 steps, do you have, to, do you have to do all of them? Do you have to be involved in half of them? Do you have to do any of them? Like, that's interesting. Um, yeah, some of them, like the comp research. Yeah. But now what I'll do with the comps is I will go in and look at them and then I put them all in a spreadsheet or I have a spreadsheet that I show clients when I'm doing my comp work. So she'll put them in there and that's where we have the compounding. And so she'll do all the research to put it into that spreadsheet, but I'll pull the initial ones and then I'll have the conversation with the clients. But in terms of the pre-list meeting information that goes out, like I have a website that goes out with all my information on there. That is all that can all be done by her minus a few things that I need to touch. So essentially what you're doing is you're, you're enhancing the experience for the client by having the systems in place. And, and when you have the systems and people in place, um, you can be more efficient in terms of getting things done the way that they're supposed to be done and things aren't gonna fall through the cracks, right? Because 
Um, I, I even remember once like two years ago when, when things were absolutely crazy, I had a condo coming to the market and these were like offer date times where you had to have the status. And I was like, holy shit, I forgot to order the status. Like it was like, it just somehow like all these things are happening. We're normal. Yeah. yeah. And, and where it's like, I knew if I had just had like a system and, and I did have a system, but we had like eight listings at the time. And I was like, okay, this one thing slipped through the cracks and it wasn't like a big deal, but I'm like, how did this happen? So um, I want to get into the market with you for everything that's happening today. But just before we do that, and, and I want Steve's take on this too. Why do we overcomplicate everything? Why do real estate agents go, I'm going to reinvent everything here. I'm going to do it my way. Uh, I, I'm not going to do it like that person. I'm gonna, like, has anything changed in real estate really? Like what was the goal of a real estate agent 25, 30 years ago to help buyers and sellers? And that's kind of the goal of a real estate agent today. Like why, why, why are we trying to reinvent and complicate everything? I think it's because pu the public's perception has changed. I think the public's access to information. I think the public's um, awareness of the different caliber of agents that exist. Um, when they can walk into a showing and see something that looks bang done well, and then they go into the other one and they're like, oh, something was missed here, right? So then their expectations have changed. Like even since I've been in real estate, the costs of a listing have grown dramatically compared to when I first started. And that's because of just, I think how the markets evolve, like staging wasn't really a thing when I got into real estate and now it's a major thing, Perf you know, professional photography. I had, I bought a nice SLR digital camera, but yeah. we didn't necessarily hire the photographers. Steve, are you, are, are you having to do staging now in Vancouver? Is staging becoming a thing in the Fraser Valley? Cause in Toronto, it's like, you want to be a top realtor. You offer staging. It's, it's part yeah. of the thing. Like you're not going to no. know. Not it's, really. Uh, I mean, we stage all of our properties with a, with a consult, but our fee structure is so much lower than yours that there's no yeah. money in staging. If if an agent offers staging here um, on our average price property, their profit after that home sales might be a thousand bucks. Oh wow! So it's it's a zero. Like there's no point in you know four or five thousand dollars on top of all the other expenses. Right? Is it going to come here? I think it, the reason staging came into play. And just like every enhancement in real estate is because the competition got so big, right? Like we've had 15, I think it's 13% of the agents added to our board in the last 60 days. Wow. Right. So the, the, there's now so many agents out there that you, you have to do the next thing in order to get more business. Right. So I think it's creating a better marketplace. It's creating better things uh, and, and tools for the people to get their homes sold. I don't think it's bringing prices down uh, for fees. And I'll give you an example of that. The most common uh, fee structure when I got into the business was uh, we have a tiered fee structure, right? 7% on the first 100,000, 2.5% on the balance. That was almost every single listing you saw. Now, that's 7 and 3. Hmm. So as a result of all these things coming in, the agents are saying, okay, we're not charging as much as say, you know, in Seattle, for instance, your average commission is like 6% across the board. So you're not charging uh, as high of a fee. You can't do all those things. So they've actually now had to increase price. So competition, this is, I don't know if the competition bureau is going to whack me. Competition here in the Fraser Valley has led to higher real estate commissions, not lower real estate commissions, which is the exact opposite of what everybody tells us would happen. Can, can I add to that? Because I think the public's perception of what we do and the, the depth of what we do, they don't have all of the knowledge. And so staging is this one thing that is very, it's, it's very easy for them to see. But having good negotiation skills, being organized so that nothing drops on a listing or a buy, having the right service people in your corner so that your clients are handled well, having good processes so that, you know, everybody receives the same experience. And yeah, like 
to your, the status we've all done. We've all forgotten our shit status, but you know, there's times where I've worked with mortgage brokers who just haven't closed a deal. I don't know why they just ran out of time. Yeah. Those are the things that people don't see as valuable because they don't know that it's coming and they don't know how to ask for that. So staging is an easy thing to compete on. But I wish the public knew more and that they could see that there's so much more to working with a good agent than just the staging. And that here's they the understood, number one but thing. it's a big wheel. Here's the number one thing right now. I spend most of my time coaching the other agent on the other side of the transaction, how to do the transaction. So they're not going to their managing broker or broker of record, whatever you guys call it out there. They're not doing that. They're slapping a contract together, sending it to me. And then I have to go, no, this does, this is not legal. This doesn't work. You can't do this. This is done incorrectly. We do all of these things. We get the deal together. Now here's the problem on the other side of the transaction where I know there's either an inexperienced agent or an agent that just doesn't care or whatever, they're not going to tell their their clients that they're the problem. Right. Right. They're not going to be like, oh, crap, I didn't know these four things that needed to be in the contract. I'm sorry. The counteroffer came back with all these other terms. And by the way, I also don't. I also don't know how to explain these new, you know, like we have a very specific title term here in our uh, title condition in BC and you could use the old one, but it's not legally binding. So you have to use the new one and almost every offer that comes in, guess what Steve has to change. And now they're like, because the new title clause looks crazy, right? It looks uh, very cumbersome. And if you don't understand why it's in the contract and you can't explain that to your client, it looks like I'm trying as the listing agent to get one over on the buyer, but that's not it at all. I'm trying to make a firm contract. So the buyer gets the house and the seller can't walk away. Right. But that's not how it's seen because the agent doesn't have the skill. So how do I tell my client that they're not going to have any idea. They're just going to, if I even try to explain it to them, probably like yeah. most listeners on this podcast right now, they're just going to glaze over, right? <laughs> they don't know what they don't know and they don't know why they don't, or they need to know what they don't know. We should have a segment called There's... Steve, Steve explains forms uh, for, for yeah. two minutes. Of every... That's, called Carish, yeah. that's <laughs> called the Carish Real Properties YouTube channel. <laughs> Well, and I think that we also try to avoid the drama, right? Like the me- there's enough drama in the media. There's enough drama that we all discuss and there's enough perceived drama with, with the public in terms of, you know, I hear it in the, all the time in like my yoga classes. Oh, well, my agent told me I wasn't allowed a home inspection clause or my agent said I can't do these things. And <laughs> what they hear probably hear is different than the reality but given the timelines and the amount of stuff that we communicate with to them and with them it's really hard so then you don't want to then layer another thing on top that says oh and by the way that there's this new clause and it protects you more but the other guy doesn't know it and i've put this in because now it's just becoming lost right yeah those clauses take time and here's the thing like when i'm explaining i know what clause needs to go in It takes time to even read that clause to my clients, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to know why that particular clause needs to be put in, I have to explain to you the way contracts went bad in the past. I also have to explain to you the way contract law has gone on for the past hundred years in real estate in order for it to all make sense for something that you probably are going to, first of all, you're going to forget about it and you don't really care because it's a title clause and all I care about is price and dates. Right. So this is this is the interesting part about our industry that doesn't get highlighted. And I get back to what you said. You can't show that. I can't show that to you, the client of why my depth of knowledge is likely more what you're paying for than the amount of open houses I'm doing. Right. Which is why email templates are good, because an Mm -hmm. email template would actually allow you to send that out in advance. And it would probably save you a lot of the explanation. Like I do that for Kai Tech, for home inspections, pre-home inspections. I kind of go through, here's what the public says, but here's what you really need to know. And then I'm not re-articulating it every time. They get it. They can read yeah. it if they want to, if they don't. But And that sounds like it would be a great one for you to do around that. And it would really highlight your knowledge as well. Tom, do you 
have you real um from all the clients that you're meeting on YouTube, have you found that they are more informed and easier to work yeah. with? Yeah. Yeah, it's been really interesting. So yeah, so Jen, so you know, me and Steve, other than the obvious ways that most successful realtors get business from repeat and referral and, and you know, strategic alliances with other realtors in other parts of the country that we send clients to, depending on who can help. Both of us this year, I know, have helped over 20 people buy properties that that met us through watching our videos, right? Which is really cool. And it's interesting because when they phone us or book an appointment with us, it's not like 400 questions. It's like, hey, I've been watching you for six months. Uh, I know this, this, this. And they'll reference things you said, which is so cool. Uh, we want to work with yeah. you. So yeah, absolutely. Like the people that are, but again, I think that's a personality type too, right, Steve, right? The type of person yeah. that will go Doing online, the do their research for three to five to six months and then make their decision and then reach out when they're ready, where yeah. there are many people that are just like, I don't know, whatever, like let's work together. Um, but they're definitely super educated coming in from those platforms. And this is just like the same example of the template. We just, mm -hmm. instead of, setting up the template made a video about it right like it's kind of to the same everybody thing. To everybody it's funny jen that you brought up uh kai tech because tom did a video on his channel all about kai tech plumbing and we don't have that out here i've never even heard of it before and so but we, what we do have is polybutylene piping which is just as bad right if there's problems or whatever i think currently on my channel right now that video gets something like at, at minimum 25 views every single day right and it's up to i want to say seven or eight thousand views and it's because i got sick of repeating myself yes. to all of the clients that were like what's wrong with poly b and like honestly the the explanation of poly b piping is something everybody with a 1990s house has to know but it's a very long explanation so now it's like watch this video if you have any questions after this let me know and they're like okay no questions Right. I just feel like, like I massively okay. dated myself by telling you I do email templates and you guys do videos. So now I feel like I'm a no, super we do old templates too. In the group. No, we do we do templates too. It's just it's just uh, I'm not as good at like my email responses to people are like great, see you soon. I'm not like an essay guy. I'd rather just send them a quick one to one video, being like, here's the things that are happening today. It's just our way of doing it, but it's well, all the same. When I was in when when we did our kind of mastermind thing in uh, Toronto few weeks ago um that was actually one of the points that i presented on right is here's my here's my full email templates that go out to my clients to reduce their stress right like it here's so they know because i think the where most agents fail is do they communicate properly with their client right an incoming call from your client is a bad thing right it means they don't have some information Right now, if it's in negotiation, sure. But like any other time of the week, I don't get phone calls on Wednesdays from my clients. Hey, what's going on? You know what's going on, right? And that's because I've hopefully given them all of the information they need in advance. They may not like the information, but they have the information. And I think that that is what so much of our uh, industry is missing, right? When it's systemized, you know, to Tom, to what you mentioned something about earlier, when you have eight listings, if you have something that's systemized, it removes the middle of the night, oh crap, did I do this one thing? Yeah. Which that is a good place for us to be able to sleep, to be able to to manage all of those listings, right? And it, if you're, as one of your steps, if you have send an email on Tuesday afternoon to all of my listing clients, then you're eliminating those incoming calls too. Jen, I wanted to ask you because both you and Steve were selling real estate in 2008 and I was, I was not, I will not be, I'm not going to tell you what I was doing in 2008, but I was not selling real estate. Uh, it, wasn't anything, email templates. it wasn't anything bad. I was just like probably in high school or, or university, but elementary um, school. Yeah, no, I was not in elementary school, Steve. Um, to be fair, Tom, let me stop you there. Yeah. I sold zero real estate in 2008. So but you I had your license? In 2008. Okay. I got licensed on December 15th, which is exactly 60 days after the greatest financial crash of our generation. So, um, so which, 2008, 2009, I, yeah. I recognize what is happening now is way different than what was happening then because then you didn't see as much price drop off as it was just activity drop off. It was a different thing happening in specifically in our markets. Obviously, the States is a whole different conversation. 
but the uncertainty feels the same um, where people are like, they're scared. They don't know what to do. And so I don't think it feels wise, the same, Tom. I don't feel think it feels the same at all. Okay, so why back, not? Back then, you didn't have a lot of... Um, it's scarier now, probably. A lot of people then didn't want to then get into the market, and you also could not find financing. Mm. Now... You can find all the financing you want. It's just more expensive. And I don't know what you're experiencing right now, but more than ever, the demand is going nowhere. The affordability is gone. So that means nobody, there's all these people that still want to buy more properties. They still want to buy their first property. They still want to move up. They just can't do it because they can't afford the money that's being lended. In 2008, they canceled projects that were already cranes in the sky here in Surrey. Right. Like there was Infinity Tower, which is one of the most prominent, like first high rises in the city. Just that that crane spun in the air for like 16 months. Just stopped. Couldn't get financing. The developer was ready to go. He couldn't fund the project anymore. So he couldn't get money that I don't feel that that is the case right now at all. And that's the big difference between now and then. So so different, but still uncertain. Like we're still it's always we're, uncertain. Well, but but more. Yeah. I mean, we have five rate hikes in five months, and things what totally what shift. What certain time have we ever lived in? We have never lived in a certain. Time okay, ever. less less certain. I'm asking Jen the question, not you, Steve. All okay, right. I'll so sure. <laughs> so going through you, you've sold in that in that market. I guess just like what's going on? Like, are 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 we going to come out of this? Is this going to be a longer? to come out of because it's different with the interest rates. What what advice are we giving to buyers right now? What are we telling our sellers? Because it's, it's you, the news is scary. Well, the news is always unnecessarily scary in right. my opinion. I don't feel very passionate about the news. That's why we don't have a good love, love relationship. Yeah. Um, I kind of view a bit of a standoff to some degree. And the standoff, I, I had this conversation with my clients for my listing today. In my spreadsheet, I put in, you know, it sold this and what it would be at today's price. And there was one, uh, I don't know, it, the price for September was actually higher than the price from when they sold. So mm. technically, on paper, it looks like the prices have risen. So my client's like, well, therefore, I should get a higher price. And I'm like, yes by the numbers you should and that number is for you know downtown toronto condos in co1 so the co1 number i think for september was higher for august i may have the month i think yeah, that's yeah, what, yeah. what i was looking yeah. at right so on paper that makes sense and from a factual point of view that makes sense where then you get into some interesting things is other agents saying well you know there's going to be another there, the recession's coming there's going to be another rate rate increase so you better lower your price now or you better accept a lower price right they're, they're selling a story that doesn't necessarily equate to the facts to some degree well and i think yeah go ahead no, no no go keep going keep going well and i think again it really depends on the market and being really micro with things and what the media is reporting on is the jumbo picture as opposed to looking specifically at your neighborhood, your type of home, what's been happening. And then having a bit of grace to the fact that even if we can have those numbers and we have those stats, our conversations with buyers are going to be different, right? You've got this, when we represent buyers, we're obviously going to be saying the same thing. Well, there's a recession, there's rate increase, so you better give us a, be a better price. But what we're saying to our sellers is, well, technically you shouldn't really be accepting a super low price because the numbers don't reflect that. So it's a bit of a standoff. I think, I think the conversations the two, are changing, yeah. The news, um, we're seeing the news uh, in how it always operates, which is too late, right? They're going, yes. we're gonna see a 30% price drop in the Fraser Valley. Cool. Yeah. You're reporting on what has already happened. So now here's the problem. Now the buyers are coming into our market where a house was one eight. Now it's one three, right? They're coming in and going, okay, that's one three. I need 30% off that price. And it's like, eh, guys, if you actually look at our market, our market has started to bottom, right? Like our, our declines were heavy until uh, uh, through August and our September prices were kind of rounding out. 
No, it's is it going to continue to trend downwards? Yeah, but that's the thing. People are coming in and going, okay, well, the news says it's going to be, it's going to go thirty percent down, and no, the news is reporting on on August numbers right now, and that's the drop that we saw from fit from March to August, right? So that's already happened. So these are now today's prices, and that's why once oh, the media catches like- it. It's, we're past it. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Like that's yeah. what I always yeah. tell my clients. Once the media is reporting, you missed it. We are on the ground. We are the ones that have the intel before the media gets it, and that's where a lot of the information should be coming. So Tom, right, saying, right yeah. now with with your own with your active clients, it's like are are they coming to you with concerns saying, "Well, I read this, I heard this. Should I do this? Well, what if the the rates go up again? What should I do here?" Because I, I think truly, and what I like the fact that you're doing with the agent training program is like, I think if there is one thing that real estate agents could get better at, and there's many things they could get better at, but if there's one thing that is setting correct expectations by using data, by showing them, by not going by your gut feeling, by laying it out and showing them, here's what's happening. It doesn't, it's not what I think. It, it doesn't even matter what I think or, or really what they think. Truthfully, it's like, here's what the market is showing us, right? So how can we get better at setting expectations? Because that's the thing. If you tell a seller a price that doesn't exist to appease them, you're not helping anybody. You're just wasting everybody's time. But then there's agents that have never had to have that conversation because they've only been selling for five years and it's always been, well, let's try and maybe they get it. Now they got, you got to be damn good at setting expectations because if you don't, you're wasting your client's time. You're not doing a good job for them. So how can we, and, and what are you maybe telling the people in your program and then even just telling your own clients, how are we setting correct expectations right now? Because I think that's like the thing. You got to be really good at that. So in the webinar I ran two weeks ago, which is, a, it's all about like recession, what you should be doing for your business mm-hmm. now. One of them was not having desperation breath. So the very first thing would be, don't take a listing that's overpriced just because you're worried about not getting a listing. The any time that I've ever done something just because I was desperate to do it, it's always been the worst turnout. The other, so that's one side. The other part is you have to learn how to be a good communicator and presenting the facts helps you. It helps the clients. It helps the industry. When I build that spreadsheet that I put all my comps in, more often than not, I'm using that when I talk to the other agents as well, because they haven't done the research and they haven't put the time in. And so I'm then able to present to them a very factual set of data that they can look at. And a lot of times, because they haven't done the research, they'll go and present that to their client which works out very well. I'm giving away all my my secrets right now, but at the end of the day, it also allows my clients to see what I'm talking about. And I said to these clients, look, this number shows that it's higher. So I can see why you would want a higher number, but this is what I think is coming down the pipe. Let's have a discussion. And I always say to people, this is not me telling you, let's discuss Mm -hmm. it. It's a collaborative, um, it's a collaborative experience. And I think for agents, they are going to le- it would be in their best interest to learn how to have open, collaborative, fact-based discussions. The, uh, the art of uh, presenting an offer, specifically if you're a buyer's agent, presenting an offer to a seller uh, is, in my estimation, all but gone. Right? Like, it just basically... So we present it until... Uh, March 2020, we presented all of our offers on my team in person to the seller, right? So you, my, my agents would go to the seller's house with the listing agent, sit in front of them and go over it. Is the buyer would, in the car or are they uh, Usually, yeah. usually, you know, uh, the couple of years before that, AuthentiSign got pretty good, right? DocuSign got pretty good. So they could usually just be on the phone often. I've uh, for sure I can could offline give you some really big names in my market that do a ton of business that left the offer presentation. Chanani on my team, her whole thing was like she she did this every time. She said, listen, and, and part of this is real. I'll let you guess which one she did or didn't have in the car. But she would say to the seller after she was done her presentation. Now, I know you've got a lot to think about. Your agent here is going to guide you through that. I'm going to go out in the car. Don't worry about me. 
I've got my dinner and my sleeping bag. <laughs> right? Now, she for sure had her one of those two. I'll, you could pick. I don't know. But she she was ready to sit outside and because it's the easiest thing you can do is just to be the person that's most available for a counter offer, particularly in a, in competing offers. But when the market gets tough, presentation needs to be everything that Jen was saying. Like, I'm going to go in as a buyer's agent in to sit down with the seller, and I'm going to say, I appreciate it. You know what? I would love to be able to bring you an offer at this amount. However, the data shows me this is the price per square foot. These are the last sales. This is what the market is doing because there's a really good chance that their agent has not shared that information with them. And if you can't do that as a buyer's agent, you are doing, like, that is your job. Your job is not open the door, right? Your job is not, do you like this house? That's what people think our job is. And my job is to go in and negotiate. So if you don't know, like we used to have a custom letter when I started with Chris in uh, 2010, it was like, here is your argument. We would br bring out price per square foot. We would have the last three sales in the area. We would, we would have all of the information. So they couldn't say anything, but I just don't want to accept that price. Right? They couldn't, they couldn't argue the numbers in any other direction. And that art is gone from this industry as far as I'm concerned. Well, I mean, we, presenting in person doesn't really exist anymore in our market. Like, and I would actually say we, it stopped here at probably, Jed, what, 2017? A after early yeah. 2017, where you're sitting in your car for six hours about to pee your pants, waiting for the 12 other offers to get looked at, it stopped. And then it went all, all virtual. And then obviously the pandemic, it, it stayed that way, right? So... If that doesn't come back. I, I want to share a quick story here because you just yeah. brought it uh, back to mind. I have seriously been <laughs> the guy in the like the front seat of the car, legs crossed like, <laughs> oh, this is not going to go well if they don't. So then they invite me in. I said, they're like, okay, we're going to go with your offer. We just got some minor changes. I'm like, that's fantastic. Can I please use the bathroom? <laughs> Right. Like I, that is a real life story. But yeah, like it, it's I've watched gone. my gas and meter go to like I'm on fumes sitting in there. But well, Jen, do you remember like it used to be in Toronto? You, you'd be one of 12 cars outside the house. You go in, present your offer and then they do the callbacks on, OK, we're not going to go with you. And then you see cars start moving. And, that, yeah. and then when there was like two cars left, you're like, okay, there's only two, maybe it's us. And then it's like 11 p.m. at that point. And then you either get it or you don't. And then you go home and then you do it again. And you just it just felt normal. So part of me is happy that's not happening anymore. But I yeah. do agree with Steve in the fact that like, yeah, if you could actually go sit face to face and have the buyer, the seller, and both real estate agents and work it out, a lot more uh, conclusions would be made in terms of, of agreeing. There's probably a morph because I've won many offers by presenting my clients to the sellers, right? Mm -hmm. which, is, which is a skill in itself. The sitting outside for five or six hours, not so cool. So I think that there's a morph maybe whereby, and that's why we did start introducing the letters so that they still get that option to read them. But, you know, nobody really wants it to take seven hours to do a negotiation, except for maybe an, an agent that really has a strong ego on certain things. So, you know, the most efficient thing that you can do for your client is probably to streamline it remove as much of the emotion and it's a very emotional process to be sitting out there for you know seven hours and cars waiting and all that stuff streamline it so maybe video presentations are a nicer way to go like hmm. pre-record a video presentation submit it with your offer the seller can hear it but then everyone's still at home and then you can do your negotiations afterwards so then you're still doing your job as an agent but you're taking down the amount of time the other thing i was thinking about and you'd mentioned a question about you know, for new agents and what should they be doing going into this recession, I think beefing up their buyer presentation. Yeah. So for new agents who are going into a market where they're up against a lot of experienced agents, it's a great time for them to really showcase a desire and a knowledge based on what they have in their presentation package. Because I bet a lot of agents don't even have one anymore Yeah, because they just assumed they would get it. Mm-hmm. So to be able to do that, it shows you put some care into it. And I think that's what people are going to want to see right now is care. I'd like to know your opinion on, especially for someone listening that's getting into the industry or is newer in the industry. Uh, we've chatted about this in other episodes where if you look at purely market share, 
the actual disruptor in the last decade in real estate, you could argue is teams or mega teams or these mini brokerages that are not brokerages, but really are, you get what I'm trying to say. So as a, as a agent that runs a successful business like you do with the operations manager and other, and other people helping maybe when you're not here, can single agents still do it? Is it possible in this market to survive without all the resources and other people involved? Like, can a single agent still thrive or short every new agent basically be going, what team am I going to join? Is that just the reality of where we're going here? This episode of the Tom Story Show is brought to you by the YouTube for Real Estate video course. Are you interested in creating an engaging, value-driven YouTube channel to help educate your client base on real estate in your market, as well as introduce a new revenue stream to your business? Perhaps you've already created a YouTube channel, but are struggling to gain viewership and the subscribers you are looking for. The YouTube for Real Estate course will provide you with proven tips and strategies on how to create and cultivate an engaging YouTube channel, as well as how to optimize your channel, resulting in higher viewership, subscribers, and yes, deals. But that's not it. I implemented YouTube in my business in early 2021, and it has easily been the best marketing source for meeting new clients that I have ever had in my business, period. Better than expensive geo farming, internet marketing, and open houses combined. And now it even rivals my repeat and referral business. If you would like to learn all the tips and tricks, for meeting new clients using YouTube, simply go to video course login or click the link in the description below and sign up for the YouTube for real estate course today and learn a year's worth of my painstaking research of learning how to use YouTube for real estate in just a few hours by taking the YouTube for real estate course. So go to videocourselogin.com right now and use the promo code TOMSHOW at checkout. Again, that's videocourselogin.com or simply use the link below. I see that as Steve has mentioned, agents need training. I do think that there are teams where it's not productive and it's True. not productive training and it's not a good environment. And I think it depends on your personality, you know, so it depends whether you want to be someone that just does transactions. If you have the larger goal of wanting to build something that is your own and that's sellable when you're done versus you just walk away. Um, Teams are really good because they offer you some training and they offer you leads and they they remove a lot of the fear factor that exists for a new agent. But I think you it's important to look at your personality, where you want to go. And that's also why, I mean, this training program gives people the option of getting the training without having to join the team. Right. If that's not their path that they want, right? Like I'm taking my 16 years, I'm telling you everything that's there so that you can go out and be successful on your own if that's your choice. But the main thing is just don't go into this industry thinking that it's everything you studied in the books because it's yeah. not. And yeah. to to represent your clients well and to represent the industry well and to do well, get some training, whether it's on a team or with something else like this. I think that is the first yeah. step before deciding. What people don't like to internalize is I always use the the golf analogy, right? Like when you learn about how to sell real estate to get your license, it's like golfing and handing you a rule book. And then once you pass knowing the rules of the game, they hand you a set of clubs and your PGA card and they're like, cool, you're a pro golfer now, right? Nobody's taught you how to swing a club yet. Nobody's taught you anything that you need to know and I get very frustrated with it just because I did come up through like a full proper mentorship, right? I worked under uh, my previous team leader, who's now mostly retired, for a decade, right? Until I went into the leadership role. And I, I get super frustrated because I put out my channel about maybe six months ago or so. I put out like, a, hey, I will offer you a mentorship program so here's what you you get you get like access to me we'll do two calls a month where we you know do maybe group calls or whatever you have questions you're not sure how to do things i don't care about like don't ask me manager broker stuff ask me like okay business stuff or or mm -hmm. negotiation things and the amount of people that reached out to me was like yeah i'm in i'm in i'm in i'm in i was like cool so here's the only catch it's going to cost you $100 per month 
So I'm not just throwing away my time, not because I wanted to make money, but because there's got to be something You're in right. the game. And as soon as anybody heard any sort of investment in themselves, they're out. They're gone. Sorry, no, I don't have a hundred dollars a month to spend on improving my skills, of which each time I make a sale, I'm probably making somewhere between six and twenty five thousand dollars. It's insanity. It's absolute insanity. And it's insanity that our organized real estate doesn't have a mandatory portion like you would have in any trade or any skill. Can you imagine if your lawyer got his license and it was just like, oh, I know he took a six month course and he's good. No law school, no bar exam, no nothing. It's just like, yeah, you're good. Doctor. Yeah, no problem. Here's your, here's your, here's your certificate. Go. I think we need to back it up even just one step before in that they don't even know good team, bad team, good brokerage, bad brokerage. What should I look for? Like when I came from a corporate job to real estate, how I was interviewing was much different than the reality of how I should have been interviewing. And so I think, Tom, to what you were mentioning about team or no team, you guys run, you guys are smart you're ethical, you're great at what you do, you're a good team to join. If somebody joins a team that that is not the case, they're sort of, we're just perpetuating bad industry behavior. But if you are new, you don't even know that that's where you should be thinking. You know, as you were saying that, so, you know, we talked about before, it's like for the consumer, what they can visually see um, is staging or maybe they check out your Google reviews, but they don't see inside your mind of why you're actually good at your job. Uh, And hopefully you can do a good enough job explaining that in your presentation to any buyer or seller, right? And then you take that same thought process and go, okay, new agent joining a team, what do they see? What's the thing that they see that they wanna go? And it's probably like, who's got the most followers on Instagram, which doesn't mean a thing because they're probably fake anyways and paid for. like. Or, or you know, this office is great at new construction, so I have to join them. But- right. There's there's all these reasons that I, I, I can I understand now looking back, if I go back to the beginning of my career and just look, I, I didn't know. Uh, it would have been nice to have that guidance. But then it's also that fear of like, well, what if I join someone and go all in on this and it's not what I thought it was going to be? And, and not that you're getting scammed, but it's like they're kind of just using you for them it's so difficult to make that decision and really any good training you're going to pay for it, there's not much free training out there like you can go online and, and learn at, at what you want but being beside someone and having a mentor has saved me five to ten years of trial and error yeah yeah business. you're gonna pay you're gonna pay for it in either money or time yeah you pick because you can learn That's life every, with everything everything you need to know now my opinion is youtube is better than university now the only problem is, what crap do you have to sift through to get the information? How much time is it going to do and how much do I need? For instance, um, when I started with Chris, you know, I did, I think I did four deals my first year part-time in the business, 2009. And then when I started with Chris, in the second half of the year, so I started with him May or June of 2010, I think I did 25 deals in the second half of the year. Right. So it's like that was five years previous, five, six years of training in that one year or half year in six months. And that didn't include his deals of which I was shoulder to shoulder with him on all the way through the process. Right. So like the, the having a mentor or having a coach just gets you through so much faster than the people that are just not willing to invest and learn and admit that, you know what? Maybe I need a little bit of help. Well, it's so funny to me. With our in- Go ahead. I, I just like the one thing I always got from Richard Robbins is he was always like, you just listen. You're just, you just do it. I'm like, yeah, man. Cause what else am I going to do? I'm just, I'm just going to do it. And then it worked. But then I talked to all these other agents that called me and asked about any coaching company. And they're like, I just don't know. I don't think it will work for me. I'm like, well, you're the common denominator because it works for everybody else. <laughs> like, what's what's the thing here, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to, to put that in there. Well, I guess that's what you said at the beginning, reinventing the wheel. So don't reinvent mm. the wheel. 
but make a decision about the correct person to get your training with versus the incorrect person. So the best advice for a new agent would be to even be aware that that's out there. And then don't reinvent the wheel. Just start with somebody. Trust them mm -hmm. and trust that they're knowledgeable on it. So you don't have to change your tires. You don't have to put a new tire on your car to reinvent the wheel. You just have to change it from summer to winter tires. And that's what like coaching or mentoring or, you know, that's kind of a, a cool way to look about it. I got two questions for you, Jim, before we wrap up. And then I want to hear more about what you're offering to agents and where they can find you and, and everything about it. So um, I want to start with this first. So the agents that eventually do want to retire and you don't want to go to their funeral, you want to go to their retirement party. I guess just mindset for those agents that are maybe listening to this, they're at that point in their career. Can you successfully sell a real estate business? Does it, can you only do it if it's under not your name? Can you do it under your name? Like how, how do realtors need to think about that? They need to think about it and do a succession plan. And I think that's where, you know, companies, CEOs, everyone has a succession plan. No one talks about that for real estate agents. And you can have that by starting now to systemize your business. If you don't have a CRM, if you don't have systems and processes in place, if you don't know, you know, how many clients you have and how much money, there's nothing to sell. That's you know, that's the agent that's going to be working till they're 86, which is a family friend of mine, you know, because she didn't have that exit plan. If you are a new agent, I think it's a good opportunity to talk to somebody who is possibly looking to get out and help them build this. That's a great thing for a new agent to do is help them build those systems and processes to get out. So no, it's not too late if they want to start and get that. They need to have something to sell. It's business 101. Right. Without yeah. something to sell, you can't do it. So the only way to really do that that I can think of is to have systems in place, to have a CRM, and to have things that you can put on paper and say, this is the value of X. Because Steve, you kind of did that. Maybe it wasn't intentional, but you know, you went to a successful agent that was not winding it down at the time, but more recently, and then you essentially bought the business, right? Yeah. But was that yeah. the plan the whole way through or did that kind of just morph into that? Uh, it was definitely his plan all the way through. There you go. <laughs> um, for sure. But we both had a learning curve on what that looks like. Right. Right. So the, unfortunately, there was a bunch of preaching going on uh, you know, 90s and early 2000s about how you're going to sell your business. And it's a totally different thing than what most people think. However, I do know that I know how early I need to start the succession plan for myself as well now, having gone through it from the, from the buying side, right? Having bought a business. And I also know now a lot more about the pitfalls of, of the whole situation. But there's no chance I would be in the in the scenario I'm in right now had I not mentored under someone. There's just no chance. I wouldn't have I've bought the business. The business transferring over wouldn't have been as successful as it is. There is no step along the way that would have been easier if I just figured it out myself. And honestly, I would have failed. I 100%, if Chris didn't come to me one day, because here's what I did do. I did go into the office every day, and that's the only thing I did right the only thing I did right. I did nothing else right. And it took him coming up to me and just saying, okay, listen, you obviously have no business and I obviously have too much business. Let's go. Right. And then I was like, okay, like, I, I don't know. I'm not a spiritual dude, but if that's not a sign, I don't know what is right. So I don't know. I'm just, I, I am already thinking about a succession plan as you mentioned, Jen, right? Like it does have, I'm 42. Uh, ideally I'm not working much past 60. And that means within 10 years, I need to find the person that is the person that will start working with me for the following decade to get me out the door in time. Right? And before that, that just making sure that your business is completely systemized. Like when my, my ops manager is leaving at the end of this month and I have a whole behind the scenes document with everything. Mm. I can literally pick it up. Yeah. There's links, there's videos, there's the how to's. Oh, I've got a way better plan than that. Uh, my, okay, my, amid, my administrator, my administrator is never allowed to leave. <laughs> okay. That's, that's the rule we have. That seems sound. Jen, have you yeah. heard of this, this, uh, app called Tango? So for, for making like, um, 
uh, manuals and whatnot, it's free. It's a Google Chrome extension and you can record a video in like Loom or something and go through doing a process and it will somehow watch you do it and make a 10 page PDF on what you've just done. It's so cool. Can it do it for my household chores? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's only it's virtual, fun. I believe. <laughs> Um, okay, one last question. Then I want I want to hear where people can find you and learn more about what you're yeah. doing to help. The, and, and especially as, as well, I know this has been a real estate focus episode, like industry. But I know there are consumers that's made it, made it made it to the end. And I want all of you to know that all the stuff that we're doing, even this podcast, and what Jen's doing with the training, is to make our industry better, so that the consumers yeah. have a better experience. Um, just to make that clear, uh, Jen, happiness happiness in life happiness in what we do waking up getting excited about what we do because in real estate it's like even if you hit all your goals or in any business you hit all your goals okay then you got to do it again and that stresses the hell out of you and then if you don't hit your goals that stresses the hell out of you and then if you look at this person over here and this person over here and all this stuff and then you're like well okay fine i'm just going to spend more money and then you make all this money but you spent the exact amount of money to make the money so then you're not actually profitable you get where i'm going here like, yeah. how, how can we just wake up and and like this? How, how can we just not go through those roller coasters? One thing I work, I've been working really hard on for the past couple of years is to not compare and to not compete. Yeah. Because that is just a downward cycle to, well just unnecessary behavior probably and mean and feeling unhappy inside um the other thing about happiness is the fact that i've been able to travel now and i've i've been traveling as much that makes me really happy it grounds me i am so much more creative mm -hmm. when i am not in my own space and to just have that downtime because when you're in real estate all the time and the phone's always ringing or you're doing emails or all that kind of stuff, you don't get that quiet time. And so happiness to me is being able to go and visit someplace and still work because sometimes I get anxiety about taking too much time off. Yeah. Um, right? It's really hard when you're, that's the other thing they don't talk about when you're a business owner is the anxiety that comes up when you don't work. And everyone's like, oh, don't have it. But the reality is it does come. Yeah, just, so, just stop your anxiety now, Jen. Please. Yeah, just stop. I mean, I try to tell that all the time at night, but it, it still creeps in. Um, yeah, I think I was listening you, what, to, to what you said on that other podcast, Price to Sell, about yeah. happiness. And I think the perception for agents is like, again, wards, money, trips, big flashy cars, all that stuff. The other side that they don't think about or that people don't see is, okay, well, did you submit your, are you getting paid? You know, have you figured out what you owe the government? Have you looked at your taxes? Have you, is your business actually running at a profit? Do you know what your business even does? And when you start to systemize that, like I said, it removes a big element that gave me more freedom and freedom equals happiness, right? Yeah. To not work every single weekend is a sense of freedom too. I can tell you. Happiness. A really small example like that makes me happy is like I have client meetings this afternoon. I'm going to show up to those client meetings in my Patagonia sweatshirt and my jeans and my white sneakers because this is who I am and this is what they expect. Where I can tell you the agent I was in the first four years of my career is like suit and tie, be the person you think that they think you're supposed to be and that's just not going to work. Like it's just, it's not going to work. So that's my, my very small version of just like I got to I make that decision. You. I think COVID really helped with that, even for me too. Like there was many times because things were selling so properly that, I mean, so quickly that I just ran out with wet hair, which is something I would never normally do. But I was like, that I got to go. So you would just throw on whatever and wet hair and bring it on, man. I'm loving that change. That also makes me happy. <laughs> but I love it. I was going to, what were you, was it Alice? You had someone on one of your yeah, podcasts and she Alice was, was talking on. about making more videos and she said something about like for women it just takes a little bit longer like we have to do our hair and makeup and i was getting ready this morning i was like she was bang on with that because <laughs> it's true or even yesterday i was in cayman and i was trying to record some videos but it was like 40 degrees out like you can just tell them <laughs> it wasn't working you know it'd be it'd be nice to just have that flexibility to do those for sure and halfway through the videos i was like i'm just gonna keep going yeah even though there's like a chainsaw mm -hmm. on the back now <laughs> you gotta do it 
I, yeah, I, I definitely think that Alice was bang on. Like, I, I do fully recognize that for females to, to just get up and do things, there's more involved into like me and Steve, like, like this and my hair dries and that's it. Um, so I fully recognize that. Yeah. Hey, soon, but I am trying to soon. embrace your, your attitude with it though. Yeah. If so this thank keeps you. going, I'm not even going to have to do my hair soon. This is going to be perfect. <laughs> just think of how many more videos you'll be able to create, Steve. You'll just yeah, be like begging yeah, about it. <laughs> Save that two minutes every single uh, day and you'll be set. Less comb in your hair, more uh, more making videos. Um, Jen, thank you for joining us. This has been a lot of fun. Where can people find you? Um, I guess two questions. One, just you're a real estate agent. So if someone's listening to this and, and is connecting with you and wants to work with you, where can they find you for that? And then for the other realtors that would like to get into what you're offering on the coaching side of things, what's the best place to go for both? I was just going to tell you, this has been a lot of fun. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Uh, for real estate, it's gend.ca. For consulting, it's jdconsult.ca. Or my Instagram is j.dconsult. Um, I have the acceleration program, which is probably better suited to new agents. Okay. I've got some consulting, some one-on-one -on -one consulting. So if there's an agent that's been in the business for a while and they want to maybe work on one element of their business to systemize it, that's an option. I'll be rolling out some stuff for the retirement. So having your succession plan for getting out of real estate. And then I've been hosting a lot of different webinars. So on current topics. So I just did one on staging, which would be great for agents. Mm -hmm. So that would all be on my Instagram. You'll see those webinars coming up there. And something you had mentioned to me in the email when we spoke is that what you're doing with agents isn't necessarily trying to say, I'm going to replace the coach you're already working with. You're, you're, you're looking at it as like, well, if they don't have anyone, this is good regardless, but this is like an add on almost. It's like, it doesn't have to replace what you have. It's just a different perspective on the way that, that you're doing it. Right. It's building your business so that you can handle those leads. It's really no point to get a, a thousand leads a month, yeah. whether you're paying for them or you're getting them through YouTube, if you can't be managing them. It's just wasted money. And I think I, in the podcast with Kathleen Black, when she was talking about some of the people that come to her for coaching on lead generation and growing their business, they haven't been keeping track of anything. So for a year and a half, she spends that time getting them up to speed. Mm. This is... So as a new agent, get things up to speed now. I'm going to teach you all of that stuff so that when you're ready for a coach to help you with lead generations, you're set and you've got your business systems in place, which also when the market bounces back and gets fiery hot again and we're all running around, you'll be in a position. And for the, you know, like the five to 10 year agents who are like, how can I take vacation? How do I get an admin assistant? Because that's the other thing I hear all the yeah. time. I can't get an admin assistant. How would I do it? I've been running a webinar on like literally the practical, what I did day one with my assistant, what I did day two. So that they're, that is the biggest fear. What, what mm -hmm. am I going to have them do? So I walk through that practically. That's what I like where none of it's theory and all the courses that I offer to agents as well. It's like, this is what I've done. I'm not, this isn't an yeah. idea. Like here's the results and here's exactly how we did it. Um, Okay, we're gonna wrap this thing up, Jen. That was a lot of fun, Steve. Any um, any marvelous final, final thoughts? Final thought. You I do. Did. Okay. I made a note this time. I did. Wow. Because when you asked Jen uh, about happiness, I I was right before she answered, in a much uh, longer answer. I wrote down, and that, this is my favorite quote of all time: "Comparison is the thief of joy." Mm. Yeah. And there you go. When I, so I used to be that guy that would check, like on our board, we have like medallion stats, so you can like tell how you rank against all your competitors. And two years ago, I was like, I'm never looking at that thing again. And then this week, I actually looked at it for like the <laughs> first time in two years. And I was like, holy crap, I'm above all those guys. Like, this is awesome. Because you right, didn't so, look at it for so long. Because I didn't look at it. Oh, I'm not going to open it again. Like, But I, I have not. It's the first time uh, in 2022, I looked at it. And I was like, oh, this is great. So I feel good about the business I'm doing and I'm doing more business because I wasn't sitting there focusing on how much more or less business I'm doing than all of my competitors. I love Isn't it. it. Amateurs compete, professionals create, something like that. That sounds good Man, to me. Full of, full of quotes today. <laughs> <laughs> I usually get them wrong, so don't. 
<laughs> but the, it, the it sounded good. There. It sounded good. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for listening to another episode. We appreciate you being here, whether you're watching on YouTube or on uh, listening on the audio platforms. I'm Tom. Steve's here as well. And Jen was an awesome guest. We will see you next week. Bye. See you later. Thanks, Jen.